I think I came up with the neck brace due to a combination of factors. One really is because I've been interested in motorcycle racing my whole life. Started racing at the age of 16. Uh, and secondly, uh, I'm medically trained. So my history within medicine, uh, I think the two combined, is what really led me to a point where I developed the neck brace. My young son, who was four years old at the time, and I were going to watch uh, an enduro motorcycle racing event. It was during this event that one of the riders came down the mountain and called the paramedic saying a rider had fallen off and was not in good shape. And myself and my young son and the paramedic went up in a 4 by 4 to go and review the accident. And uh, there we found Alan Selby, who was somebody who was known to me, who had uh, apparently fallen off at relatively low speed, uh, and we'd assumed he'd landed on his head and potentially injured his neck. Fortunately, we had all the safety equipment with us, and we were able to try and resuscitate him. Unfortunately, the resuscitation wasn't successful, um, and that was really the turning point for me, um, particularly because my son was with me, who at the age of four had ridden a motorcycle for the first time a few weeks earlier, and it was at that point that I just uh, resolved to try and find a solution to this problem. I decided to find a product that I could use on my son, um, not feeling comfortable about him riding a motorcycle with the risk of neck injuries. And um, I looked around and couldn't find anything on the market. And the more I looked, the more amazed I was that, in fact, there wasn't a product on the market that could uh, mitigate against neck injuries. Uh, and at that point in time, I decided to start doing my own research into what would work in order to mitigate uh, neck injuries. And that, I guess, was the, the starting point of uh, the neck brace journey for me. In the prototyping process, the first one, in fact, um, I modeled on my father. It was made out of uh, foam, plastic, and insulation tape. And really just to get an idea of what uh, a platform around your neck would look like. The second one, which had to be a little bit more ergonomically styled, uh, I modeled on my wife's neck using uh, body filler or bondo as they call it in, in the US and lots of layers of tinfoil so I didn't, I didn't burn her skin and that's how we created this model uh, that became the basis for future sizing and modeling of the underside of the neck brace. The other issue with uh, developing a product that mitigates against injury is one wants to test it against a standard. In this instance there was no standard, there was no known standard like there is, for example, in the helmet industry for the effectiveness and safety of a neck brace. So not only did uh, we have to develop the neck brace thesis and test it, but we also had to develop a standard which we felt showed the efficacy of the brace um, and also mitigates any risks uh, of using a brace. What we're doing is we're taking force that would have otherwise have gone, gone down the neck and placing it elsewhere safely. Let's uh, look at an example of you fall off a motorcycle and you go over the handlebars, which is a typical scenario, landing on your head. It's in fact the weight of your torso that compresses the neck on the head when you strike the ground. And the force, therefore, is going from the ground via your helmet to your skull base, to your neck and to the rest of your body. If you have a neck brace on, uh, the same force is applied to the helmet to your skull base, but the helmet touches the neck brace at some point in time. And it's that touching of the neck brace onto the helmet that unloads some of the force. And you don't require a massive amount of force uh, as a percentage to be reduced. You need to reduce the overall force to a safe limit. So the neck brace is really an alternative low pulse technology to unload some of the force that was going to go through the neck and place it safely elsewhere on the body. We started the neck brace. We obviously started from from nothing. Um, we started to develop uh, this product with uh, input from from BMW. We started creating different ways of testing the theory. So we set up this pendulum tester, which we had a Hybrid 3 test dummy. We could put the, the brace on there. We did impacts and, and looked at neck forces. I do the testing, I see the numbers, and at the end of the day, I know uh, what a big difference the, the neck brace makes to neck forces. The one thing I really want to get across to the audience is that neck braces do not break collarbones. In fact, neck braces save you from collarbone fractures in many instances. There are three different ways in which a collarbone typically gets injured either in a motorcycle or a bicycle accident. 
The first is a fall in an outstretched arm. So as you fall in an outstretched arm, the force is transmitted up the arm towards the, the collarbone. And it's like a crumple zone in a car or a, or a, a fender that uh, will distort to, to ensure that other structures in the body aren't damaged. A collarbone, for instance, will heal quicker than a shoulder injury. Um, if you, your glenohumeral joint is damaged, your shoulder joint is damaged, it's likely to take a lot longer to recover than a collarbone. So it's actually quite a clever uh, design feature of the human body that the collarbone will fracture. The second way is, is a fall directly onto your shoulder. So if I fall on my left hand side, I will anticipate having a left side collarbone injury and hopefully the collarbone will fracture before the shoulder does. The third type of injury which we see in helmeted sports is where the helmet rim actually strikes the collarbone and causes a fracture. Now we used to think that's quite a minor number of injuries were caused by, by uh, by the helmet rim striking the collarbone. But in fact, uh, what we see in practice is actually quite a high percentage. Uh, in this instance, uh, fall in an outstretched arm or fall directly on the shoulder. If I fell on my left-hand side, I'd expect to see a left-hand sided collarbone injury. If I have a, I fall on my left-hand side and I have a downward fracture on my right-hand collarbone, that's likely to be caused by the helmet rim strike because the helmet is now forced in the opposite direction and the helmet rim strikes and causes a fracture in the downwards direction. Often people tell us that they've fallen off a motorcycle and they didn't have a neck injury but the, the collarbone was fractured and they'd rather have a, a fractured collarbone uh, than a broken neck uh, but that may be one of the negatives of wearing a neck brace. And then you scrutinize the, the, the accident and how the accident occurred and you find out that in fact a fall on the left hand side produced a left hand collarbone fracture and in that instance it couldn't have been the helmet rim or the brace because they both forced in the opposite direction it was in all likelihood just the fall on that side that caused the collarbone injury. In addition to the fact that we see the helmet going in the opposite direction and, and uh, the brace uh, come into contact with the helmet to protect the collarbone from the helmet rim we've also shaped the underside of the brace in what we call the collarbone relief area or the collarbone cutout area where the collarbone can safely sit within uh, a position on the underside of the brace that protects it from the helmet rim. A neck brace has been designed to be ergonomic, lightweight. We've got various top athletes riding with our neck braces that will attest to this. Our top of the range models weigh under 700 grams, so they, they're very lightweight and very ergonomic. EMS Great Lakes study for us was a really interesting set of data to, to look at. It was one of those reviews that were done without our knowing it was happening in the background, which of course is the best way. Uh, so there's no influence from us on the study. And paramedics who are trackside collected data from motorcyclists who were injured during uh, motorcycle accidents. And that data was then coded in, in terms of uh, you know, how severe the accident was, how severe the patient was at the time of the accident, whether they went to hospital, what their outcomes were, and what their likely diagnosis was. Uh, and if you look at this data set, it's interesting because of its size. Almost 10 years worth of uh, data was collected, almost 10,000 accidents. 89% less likely to have a neck injury with a neck brace on compared to the breast uh, population. In addition to which, 45% less likely to break your collarbone wearing a neck brace than no neck brace. And these are really big, significant numbers and pave the way to a better understanding and appreciation, I believe, for the, the riding population of how effective a neck brace is and why, in fact, you should choose to wear one. 
one of the core values within Liet is looking at the products we develop and understanding whether you would put that product on your child. Uh, remember that often the products we develop, there are no test standards for. So not only do you need to develop the product, but you also need to develop the test standard that goes along with the product because it doesn't exist in the industry. And I'll, I'll talk to the neck brace as an example. Right in the beginning, when we were originally collecting data from our initial tests, um, we did a test where we put the neck in flexion, um, not by design, but the, the test put the neck in flexion. And we got some very strange results um, that we didn't understand. And it was that point in time that I stopped in stopped uh, the development process. We brought in a team of uh, biomedical engineers like Professor Kit Vaughan, who's a Hyman Gold Sachs professor of biomedical engineering at UCT at the time. And we really analyzed the data and understood whether this was a problem with our design or a problem in, in terms of how we were, in fact, testing it. Um, so I've got no qualms with taking a product off the market or just terminating its, uh, its, its uh, design uh, and iterative process if we believe that that product, in fact, is not safe and you wouldn't put it on your child. For more information on the products listed in this video, click on the link in the description area below. Feel free to call us with any questions or place an order at 800-969-7501. Don't forget to smash that like button, comment, share, and subscribe for all of the latest DK events, videos, and promos.